we will clap again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we pass to the next speaker. And the next speaker is uh, Charlie Rabier. Um, uh, in this talk is on the SGN. SG Nolasso and its cousins for uh, selective genotyping and extreme sampling. So, Charlie. Okay, you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so. So, uh, good morning, everyone. So, um, I'm Charlie Carabier, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the Estino Lasso. So it's a joint work with uh, Céline Delmas. Uh, so I'm in Montpellier, Céline is in Toulouse. Uh, so I'm going to ex try to explain our paper um, on the Estino Lasso and its cousins. And uh, so the starting point was uh, genomic selection. So it's a famous technique in genomics that consists in a in, selected, in, in selecting individuals and the basis of genomic predictions. And uh, it started with animals and now it's heavily used in plants. And um, how does it work? You have a training population for which you observe a phenotype. So it can be the flowering date of your sunflower and uh, you observe the DNA. And then you fit a model and then you will use the model to perform some predictions and a test population that uh, contains selection candidates. And, and this population is available under the DNA. So you perform the predictions and then you select the best individuals. So the individual that tends to have the best uh, breeding values. So uh, the good thing about uh, genomic selection is that you can perform uh, predictions as soon as the DNA is available, it accelerates the genetic gain. And you do not have to wait to observe the phenotype at the uh, adult age. So it means that, for instance, in bananas, uh, eight months are required to uh, have an idea of the production capacity in citrus 25 years uh, before obtaining the fruits. Uh, so with genomic selection, you won't have to wait uh, for such a long time because once the DNA is available, you can perform predictions and then go to the next generation. And uh, so uh, to be clear, um, at the first generation, we phenotype and we genotype, we learn a model. And then at the next generation, uh, we only genotype and we perform predictions and we select individuals on the basis of the predictions. But the problem is that uh, once you have done a large number of generation, your model is not reliable anymore. It means that your prediction are not good anymore. And so you will need to phenotype again and to learn a model again. But the problem is that uh, your individuals have been selected uh, over time. So you have to learn a model using extreme individuals. And um, so the question is, how can we learn a model using selected individuals? Uh, so there is this very interesting study uh, from uh, Brandarit and Bernardo, and uh, they studied the uh, maze, and they they, uh, they studied many models, and in particular uh, Ridge regression, which is a L2 penalized regression. And what they show is that when they try to learn a model using only the best individuals, so the picture on the left, it doesn't work. I mean, the, the predictions are not reliable. And as soon as they include a few worst individuals, so this one, the picture on the right, the predictions become uh, reliable. So they conclude by saying that uh, they in order to perform GS, we need to keep a few worst individuals in the breeding programs. But uh, the problem is that if you keep the worst individuals in the program, it will be very costly. So uh, is there a way to, uh, to undeal, handle this uh, more properly? And so, and this topic of genomic selection is uh, highly linked to an old topic, uh, which is a selective genotyping. And, uh, so genotyping was very expensive in the past. So we gen uh, selective genotyping, it consists in genotyping only the extreme phenotypes. 
So it was uh, suggested uh, by Lebowitz et al. in 87. And they observed that most of the information on the, on the gene are QTL. So QTL is a locus responsible for the variation of quantitative threat. So most of the information is contained in, in the extremes individuals. And then uh, Darvazi and Zoller and Darvazi Stein formalized this concept. And we did a little, uh, some statistics theory on this. And so here is the selected genotyping model. We have the two Gaussian distribution. And uh, let's say we have two alleles, uh, plus one or minus one, and your phenotype follow either the, the green curve or the blue curve. And um, the point is that you genotype, so you have the information plus one or minus one, only if the phenotype is uh, greater than the threshold S plus or uh, lower than S minus, okay? And um, what has been shown is that under selective genotyping, the worst scenario is that when you genotype only at one tail of the population, it means that when you put the threshold S minus to S uh, to a minus uh, infinity. And the best scenario is when you genotype at the two tail of the population. So what you have to keep in mind is that the worst scenario of selective genotyping, it matches the uh, genomic selection because we select the best individuals. And in selective gen typing, we usually focus on one locus. And now, since we want to do some whole genome regression to, uh, to perform prediction using the whole genome, um, how can we uh, handle extreme uh, individuals? So here's the model. Uh, I have X, which is my genome of one individual, T star one, T star M are my QTL location. I have a, a linear model, uh, Y. Uh, so the phenotype is Gaussian and I have my Gaussian noise here. And there is the QTL effect, the QTL allele here. And what is important here is that uh, the genome information X is available only at genetic markers. And it's available only if Y is extreme. And to make it um, general, I will uh, consider the two thresholds. So I will say Y is extreme if Y is greater than S plus or Y is uh, lower than S minus. And this uh, implies a dependency between the alleles at the markers and the phenotype. And the problem is that the lasso is unable to handle this dependency and the uh, other regularization uh, method also. So a new approach is needed. So that's why we suggested the SGNO lasso. So uh, the starting point is a Manhattan plot in association studies and the interval mapping of linkage of uh, lender botch time. And uh, what I wanted to say here is that, uh, so I mainly focus on linkage studies and um, so uh, in on the x axis you have your chromosome in ordinate you have uh, your likelihood uh, ratio test and you perform tests along the genome and testing the absence of qtl versus uh, the presence of qtl and since all your tests are correlated along the genome you have a likelihood ratio test process so you perform the score test at T, the LRT at T. And what we have shown is that the, the limiting process of the score process is a Z process perfectly known. So I mean that we know the covariance function, we know the mean function, and we have studied this, pro, uh, this process under the hypothesis of MQTL along the genome. So, um, so how do, does it work? To, uh, to perform the, to build the SGNO lasso. So you first take the point of, of your, uh, of your Manhattan plot. So you take the observed values of your score process at marker locations. So now, uh, since we have dense map, we only perform tests at markers. So you keep all the points. And then in order to place the problem in the uh, regular linear model, you decolorate the process. So since I'm under linkage, in a linkage study, I perfectly know uh, the, the covariance matrix here. And uh, uh, otherwise I have to have the marker placed along the genome. Okay, so 
I write my linear model using our theoretical results. And uh, what you can see that, uh, so delta is uh, the vector of uh, the vector containing the signal. And uh, there is a red factor here, the red A that shows up and it's a factor linked to selective gene typing. So it's represented here. It's uh, the uh, uh, orange uh, surface uh, below the Gaussian density. So it's linked to the fact that uh, some genotypes are missing. And next, in order to build the S-gene lasso, you just need to, to do uh, L1 regularization. So you take the point, uh, your observed value are your uh, scored, uh, your observed scored values. You have the mean function here and you have your pen penalty here. And since we have placed the problem in the lasso context, the lasso framework, uh, we have all the properties of lasso, of the classical lasso, so vitamin, representable condition, so it ensures a consistent variable selection. And the key point here is that we have handled the dependency between the phenotype and the uh, allele at markers, which is not the case of the classical lasso. So, and uh, some applications. Um, so on simulated data, we simulated data. So uh, we consider a genome of 10 Morgans. Uh, we place uh, 16 QTN on the first Morgan. And we uh, uh, consider many methods and we uh, reported the L1 ratio, which is uh, uh, the ratio of the estimated effect uh, on the first Morgan over the estimated effect, uh, L1 norm of the estimated effect along all the genome. And what you can see here, it's uh, the blue, uh, uh, the blue lines that you have to have a look. So it means that the blue lines, it reports to this case. So I genotype only the best individuals. And you can see that only the, so the gene lasso has a L1 ratio of 85% and other method it's uh, around 22%. So other lasso methods, they did, do not work and only our method work in this case. So that's the genomic selection case. And as soon as you are in this, as soon as you include a few worst individuals, so like here, 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 all the method behaves uh, the same way. Okay, so it's linked to the paper of Rondaritz and Bernardo. And uh, you can decline the SGNO lasso in the other uh, versions. So there is SGNO elastic net, which uh, include uh, L1 and L2 penalty, SG group lasso, uh, as Gino group lasso, sorry, for um, uh, a penalty bar group. Um, and, uh, and the same simulated data, we had the same behavior. So uh, all the cousins work for the, uh, when we genotype only the best individuals. Um, an example on the rice real data. So um, uh, we took the data from Spinda et al and Begum and the trait of it, the rest was a flowering date during the dry season, 2012, and we had uh, 13,000 markers. And uh, so we kept uh, only 93 individuals and we performed, uh, so we removed the, the, uh, the full genotyping data and we kept only the extreme data and we performed a selection of 30%. And uh, the bad news is that uh, all the, so none of the method work for the, uh, for the, when we select only the best individuals. So as Gino or classical lasso methods, but what we show here is that when you, you genotype only at the two tail of the population, all the method worked. I mean, uh, for Begum et al here uh, at the top of the table, it's reported uh, the, the five genes that we are supposed to find on the on chromosome three of rice. And um, so if you gene type 15% at the right tail and 15% at the left tail, uh, uh, SGN Lasso was able to find uh, the four genes and the SGN Elastic Net five genes and SGN Group Lasso five genes and Elastic Net, the classical Elastic Net also five genes. 
And the, and the point is that, uh, so when we gene type only at one tail, it didn't work because we supposed that uh, there was a lack of signal in the data. And uh, a last slide, uh, just to show you that, uh, how does it work on the predictions. And so the criteria is a correlation of between predicted value and true values. And here it's still the same. If you keep only the best individuals in your uh, learning model, you can see that um, uh, SG no lasso has a, a, a correlation in accuracy of 30% and other methods it's 5%. And as soon as you increase it, as you include a few worst individuals in your model, all the methods behave the same way. So we believe that we do not have to keep the worst individuals in our breeding programs. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks, Charlie Lee. We have time for some questions. Perhaps I will begin. Um, do you do you use a Bayesian lasso in your uh, benchmark? Yeah, we try Bayesian lasso. Yeah, and I didn't have space to put it like uh, in, in my slide. I don't know if I'm still sharing the slide. Yeah. Uh, no. No. And uh, so uh, yeah, we tried, and uh, it's the same. It it didn't uh, uh, behave. Uh, it did not behave uh, correctly. So and. Uh, and what I have then said that we tried, so all the lasso, classical lasso methods, and also the, at the right side, there was the R lasso, which is a new method from Jenkins Fan, and it didn't work, but it was supposed to handle extreme data. But uh, uh, so we were the best in this case. Okay, so you, you, you have, a, you have a, an explanation for, uh, for why a Bayesian lasso is not uh, good? Oh no, uh, I don't. I don't know the Bayesian lasso. Uh, uh, no. But I think it's it must. Uh, uh, so it differs from the classical lasso because you have some hyper priors. And, uh, okay. Uh, and uh, but I don't think it's it's dedicated to handle this uh, dependency between y and x. So that's why we are the best on this because we we are. Method is especially dedicated to this. Okay, so we have time for other questions. 